talk us through how you took it from idea to reality. So Duncan and I quit our jobs and had this like big idea. As he walked out, like of his old company, like Boris put London and the country in, into lockdown. So not only were our pals saying we were mad, we literally will not be able to sell our beer because pubs and bars are closed right now. And we were like, this is the kind of thing when you're building a startup, there's gonna be a million things that are put in front of you to basically tell you to stop. We were like, now nah, we really believe in this and we get one shot, right? My background, I used to work for the world's biggest beer company. I used to work for AB InBev. And the reason we started an alcohol-free beer business was about four and a half years ago, we realized that we were moving away from this ritual and occasion and moment that we love so much in like, in beer. But really for us, like days is about two things, allowing like people to like live like healthier lifestyles, be more productive, do what it is with their time, but still enjoy that like amazing ritual and connection that we believe only a beer can bring. Why is community interaction such an important thing from a brand point of view. It's social. Yeah. And that's what beer is. It's like this like amazing like social liquid. The strongest thing about my business is you open it and cheers it. Then all of a sudden like you put your life into this and you and 99 out of 100 people are telling you not just like no, but like no you're stupid. It is terrifying. Up top everything looks fine under control, but underneath it's like yeah. I'm furious. I know how hard it is. And I think some people might see a headline it's like oh business goes under and you're like oh that person will be fine and they'll find a new job like that will be really soon. What a fitting start. Yeah, <laughs> you're really plugging it now. Mike, yeah, hello. Ring full. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I How are you? Now as well. You can, yeah. Look at that. Look at Look that. So, Mike, you are the founder of Days Brewing, which is a sponsor of this podcast. That's right. And I want to make it crystal clear to everybody listening that this is not going to be an extended ad. <laughs> this is going to be a discussion of exactly how the business came to be, why as a non-sober person, you started an alcohol-free brand. Yep. And what you see the marketplace, the habits, the behaviors, and everything between looking like, along with the difficulties of, of getting to this point. So For sure. let's start with that. Yeah. Why as a non-sober person did you start an alcohol-free beer brand? Yeah, yeah. So the story of days, like it really goes back to me and my, my business partner, my co-founder, Duncan. So we both grew up here in Edinburgh, played a ton of sport with each other, played a ton of sport against each other, have known each other for a long, long time. We both used to, work, used to work in consumer. So Dunks spent the last 10 years scaling food and drink brands, initially a gluten-free bread company at, called Genius, and then latterly a healthy snacking brand called Proper Corn. Both of those businesses that Duncan was involved with, really early stage startups. He was like employee number five at Genius, employee number 15 at Proper Corn, scaled them really, really quickly. But both of those businesses, what they did was created a really powerful brand that spoke to a modern health conscious consumer and wrapped it up in a really great product and took on huge categories, right? Bread and proper corn. My background, I used to work for the world's biggest beer company. I used to work for AB InBev, the guys that own Corona, Stella, Budweiser. Um, and I got really, really interested there about organic brand building and like true innovation in the drink space. And to get to your question, the reason we started an alcohol-free beer business was about four and a half years ago, we realized that we were moving away from this like ritual and occasion and moment that we love so much in like in beer like the team give me a hard time because i like to call it the world's oldest social network like there's nothing quite like like cracking open a beer and we realized about four and a half five years ago we were no longer going for a beer with pals after football on a monday night like having a beer with friends at lunchtime on a wednesday like enjoying a few beers and what we realized is it wasn't the alcohol that we wanted in that occasion it was that like sociability that ritual that moment with our pals and we didn't need the alcohol in our lives as much anymore because we were taking our physical health much more seriously, our mental health much more seriously, and just trying to be a lot more productive. So we wanted to create a product and a brand that spoke to us and allowed us to have that like ritual occasion, that moment of beer, but without the side effects of alcohol all of the time. Now, to answer your question, like I'm not sober, I still drink alcohol. I definitely drink a lot less alcohol than I used to, but I like to think I drink just as much beer. Cause I'll have these on like a Monday night and a Tuesday night. And I'm really going to try hard not to like, to push, to put, to push it all, all of this. Um, but really for us, like days is about two things, allowing like people to like live like healthier lifestyles, be more productive, like do what it is with their time, but still enjoy that like amazing ritual and connection that we believe only a beer can bring. So first of all, as a former employee of Heineken, I feel I need to give you <laughs> give you one of those. What's, For what's, those listening, that's a middle finger, but I, I I have no loyalty anymore, so I'll retract that. But it's uh, the big green machine versus yeah. InBev was was a big theme of my own life for many <laughs> yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And we weren't allowed to use the word Heineken. It was like green bottles. It's like how it was referred to, and you'd like see PowerPoint slides. It was like 
green bottles with like a brand like blurred out. <sighs> the big boys, <laughs> the big boys, they all have their tactics and methods, but that's ultimately where my, so when I joined Heineken, did, did their grad scheme yep. and then went into a full-time role in the sales yep. department in London and Heineken Zero was just being launched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a big push KPI wise for, was for us, but the foot soldiers to push that. Yep. So my fascination as a very non-sober young man at the yeah. time was, is this going to be a thing? Yeah. And when you actually saw the sales data starting to come through, you could see in London specifically, right, the relationship for those that aren't new to London is a little bit more measured and a little bit more calculated and that that has only gone in one direction. So yeah. I always use the word ceremony yeah. around a beer. Definitely. What you described as ritual as as the reason that I drink alcohol-free beer. Mm -hmm. But I think the the main thing I want to really dive into with this is the is the hyper masculine tendency for people to be insulted at the concept of alcohol free yeah. beer. Because you get it in comments, emails, yeah. everywhere. You see yeah. it all the time. I mean I've I've had them. But yeah. I whenever I feel like I want a beer, the ceremony of a beer, yeah. after playing sport, after training an evening with yeah. friends, whatever it is, having one of these mimics that without the downturn and that's not me saying oh it's it's a, it's a straight swap it's a like for like yeah but from an overall consciousness of health point of view it does make me a more conscious consumer and makes me a little bit more in control of a lot of things that are important to me which is recovery yeah. mental health physical health performance all the things that we talk about often here so with daisy tried to create something that represented that with the brand mm -hmm. but that's just an idea and for those listening there might be budding entrepreneurs. There yep. might be people that are curious, right? Okay, how have you got to the stage that there are days sat in front of us in the podcast in the studio in Edinburgh and you needed to raise some money, yep. which is obviously a very common thing to do with a startup, but yep. is not something that is necessarily as easy to understand as people might think. So talk us through how you took it from idea to reality. Yeah, so I think first thing to say is when we had like the idea... So the moment Dunks and I like quit our jobs was four years ago, basically to the day now. So we we're like end of January. So yeah, four years ago to the day. So Dunks and I quit our jobs and had this like big idea about creating like a beer business for that modern consumer. We had a pretty good idea about where we were going to brew the beers. We always wanted to brew them here at home in Scotland, like building on like a rich heritage of brewing in, in this country using great ingredients. So we'd found the brewery that we wanted to work on and we'd put together this like really clever like strategy deck and thought we were pretty like pretty smart guys to be out on this journey. February hits, February 2020, like no prize for like guessing what's coming next. Yeah. Like the country, the world goes into lockdown and Dunks and I had this moment. Dunks literally handed in his notice and like as he walked out, like of his old company, like Boris put London and the country in, into lockdown. And Dunks and I had this moment where we were like, crap, like not only do all of our pals think we're mad for starting a non-alcoholic beer business. This is like four years ago where people were still like, like non-alcoholic beer, like I don't, I don't drink that. So not only were our pals saying we were mad, but we were like, we literally will not be able to sell our beer because pubs and bars are not are, are closed right now. But at that time, we also were like, we spent enough time chatting to consumers and thinking about like the opportunity that we really, really believed in this. And we were like, this is the kind of thing when you're building a startup, like there's gonna be a million things that are put in front of you to like basically tell you to stop. Like running a startup is actually a really stupid idea when you think about it. Like think about all the things that could go wrong. You're, cho like, you're choosing friction. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're like yeah. There's, there's a million reasons my business won't work. Millions, millions of reasons my business won't work. But we saw that and we were like, hey, here's like a really easy one. We could stop and be like, you know what? We thought about doing a non-alcoholic beer business, but lockdown happened and we didn't want to do it. And we go back, back to our jobs. But we were like, now we really believe in this and we get one shot, right? So you might as well make the most of it. So we were living in London at the time, got on the last EasyJet flight out of London up to Edinburgh. There's a photo which I'll send to you. It's just me and Duncan on the plane. Like <laughs> I think two, I've seen that actually. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it does yeah. the rounds on LinkedIn. There's like two other guys on the plane and I always wonder like what they're up to these days. But Duncan and I like got on the flight and uh, turned up at our brewer and we're like, we're here. We know you've lost like a lot of demand overnight from like the on-trade pubs and bars being closed but we really believe in this opportunity. So for that six month period, all we did was just like furiously like brew beer, different like tastes, different ingredients, different, different processes to arrive at like our final products. And what that meant to answer your question was by like July, August, 2020, we'd spent six months like thinking about the brand and the vision, what we wanted to create, but we'd also just focused so hard on the product. And like, that's fundamentally the most important thing here. Like you can have a great brand, you can have like, smart like route to market strategy whatever it is if your product sucks like 
nobody's going to buy it in the first place. So we were really lucky that we got to focus on the product for so long, which meant that we went out and tried to start raising money by speaking to um, like potential investors who included like family, friends, people in our network that we'd known from like working in consumer for a while. We could say like, yes, we've done the work and we've got this like vision that we want and this brand that we want to create. But we've got these like amazing tasting beers that 0.0%, which is really important. So totally alcohol free. And I always think if we hadn't had that six month process where we couldn't really do anything apart from brew beer, we never would have got to where we are today because we would have gone to try to raise money with a, with a, with a substandard product and product, particularly in this category, and like consumer, like it has to taste good yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. So the cynics listening will be saying, well, okay, having six months of, of graft to get an MVP to pitch to investors yeah. and having that network is not something everybody has access yep. to. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, we did something similar. I was fortunate enough, parents took us in over lockdown yeah. just so we had space to breathe, yeah. um, which which was, to be fair, pretty <laughs> significant in yeah, terms yeah, of yeah. my own development journey because yeah. Jamie and I, who sat behind the production table, we yeah. had access to a gym through that, which meant that I could continue training for 500-pound right. yeah. squat sub five-minute mile, which was a real sort of yeah. notable moment in terms of trajectory. Yeah. So the, the, I assume the core of that was passion faith and graft for those six months because you had taken a huge risk you'd flown yep. back and you're right whilst you did have that six month of runway and you had the ability to sort of manage things up here yep. away from the stress and trials and tribulations yep. of being down south the currency was hard work curiosity and graft and process that got you there and yep. that's something that everybody can replicate so once you had crossed that threshold how did you deal with the I assume rejections, yeah. questions, yeah. criticisms that came from the confidence that I'm sure you had after six months of working yeah. very, very hard. Yeah. What happened next in terms of the personal challenge that you faced to be able to actually get over that inertia? Because I'm yeah, sure that's yeah. not something you'd, you'd experienced at that level before. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question as I read it. It's like, how do you deal with like that like total rejection? Yeah. Basically, which you get when you're like raising money, seeking investment or like starting anything, anything new, like, Back in those days, we would speak to like potential customers who'd be like, nah, you guys are mad. Like nobody drinks non-alcoholic beer. So you have to get pretty used to that. And I think, honestly, that was probably quite challenging. I think for both Duncan and I, we'd like done the right thing at school, done the right thing at university, had like gone to work at the right places after. And we we're probably pretty used to being told like, good job. And like, you're, 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 you're doing good. Then all of a sudden, like you put your life into this and you put like, you build up this vision, you build up like all this stuff you want to do. And 99 out of 100 people are telling you like, not just like, no, but like, no, you're stupid. Like, yep. no, this is not going to work. So naturally, of course, you're like, you're constantly like questioning, questioning yourself. As I said, like, there's a million reasons like startups don't, don't work. And people are very good at like telling you why. But I think what gave us the confidence was, if you think back to that period, like in 2020, when we were looking at like the world, chatting to pals, understanding what was going on, everybody was coming out of that lockdown wanting to live healthier. Like everyone had spent like six months at home being like, I miss being with my friends and being miss socializing, but I miss doing things. No one was like, oh, I really miss like lying, being like fucking hung over on a Sunday. People like, I miss climbing that hill, doing that thing, like being active. So that gave us so much confidence that because fundamentally this is like a health product. Like it's health is the number one trend that's driving this. That gave us the confidence to be like, okay, maybe smart investment banker from London who's going to tell me all the reasons why this doesn't work. Like maybe you just don't see it the way we do. And big believer that if everyone believed the way we do or the way we did, like there wouldn't be this opportunity, right? Because everyone would be launching like a non-alcoholic beer or everyone would have done that. But yep. you have to like really stick to like the so core the, the burden is on you. It was burden of proof, not, not uh, we've done the job. Let's walk in and, and take the money. That's yeah. Oh yeah. You've got to like, you've got to like, we would build like assumptions about like the category, about the opportunity, what we wanted to do. And we'd constantly find ways to test them. And after a while you're like, no, I really, really believe in this. I think Dunks and I benefit. We're quite different. And I think like our skill sets are quite different and our mindsets are quite different. Dunks is like, I would say like, I'm probably like overly optimistic and Dunks is like a real realist. And when I could see like, when Dunks was like going through it, all the challenges and he was like really believing in it, that gave me so much confidence. Cause yeah. I was like, he's a really, really smart guy. And if he believes in this, then there's like definitely something here. Uh, key thing to pull the thread on there because co-founders founding partners yeah. uh, solo solopreneurs are very popular at the moment yeah doing things on your ones is very popular at the moment and 
obviously you you're a bit of a yin and yang situation with the, with the way that you view things. Do you think you would have been able to get to the business to the stage it was? Did you not have that balance? No, no, no question. What is it that the business benefits from now with your optimism versus the realism of Duncan? Because I can imagine opportunity for growth, you'll see things differently to how Duncan sees them. Yep. So is there is there an example recently that where that's really come to life? Because it, it, I think it's an important thing to flag because Johnny and I with Omnia, for example, are yep. very, very different in terms of our skill sets. Yeah. We've got age gap between us. We've yep. got different focus points. We've got different family, personal situations. And that lends itself to different things. Mm-hmm. And we can often find ourselves kind of drifting towards this middle ground where we don't actually necessarily tap into those strengths and weaknesses. Right. So it's good yeah. to always remind ourselves of what those are. In, in a practical setting, yeah. we actually isolate, right, this is what you should be doing. Yeah. This is, I trust you to go off and do that. And this is what you should be doing. I trust you to go off and do that. And if we find ourselves drifting back to the middle, yeah. then we kind of have that conversation. So from your point of view, what is the most tangible example of where that disparity between the two of you yeah. has, has been present? I think like the first thing, and it kind of touches on that, and we got some great advice from a chap called Adam Keary, who sits on our board, who was the former managing director of Camden, like a very successful craft beer company. He was like, guys, there's two of you. So make sure you're each doing 100% of the work, getting 200% done. Yeah. You're not like each like on top of each other and only spitting out like 100%. Like, yeah. It's not the right word because you get more than 100%, but you know what I mean. Like there's two of you, so use it up. I think, um, I think with Dunks and I, from the start, we've always like been quite clear about running different parts of the business. Um, so Dunks has always looked after like product operations and what we call like traditional sales channels being like on trade bars and restaurants and off trade, which is like big groceries. So Tesco, and he has like so much experience there, both in like product operations, route to market that and, and sales and those traditional channels that like, I can't add any more value than Duncan can. And it's great. He just like goes off, runs it. And I have like total trust in his ability to do it because you trust not just him as like a person because you trust his like values and you know he's not gonna do anything like dodgy, but also trust his like ability to ex- to execute. So we've got like in total trust in each other. I look after like brand growth, which is like the DTC online side of the channel and like finance and finance, finance and fundraising. And we do kind of run them quite separately, but always coming together. I think to your question in terms of like things that, that work well between us, like the most important thing for us that we've got really good liquids we've got a cool brand and a category that's growing really really quickly like alcohol free beers on fire the most important thing for us is like team and culture and i think that's where like the blend of dunks dunks and i can actually work pretty well in that maybe i might be slightly more like optimistic at times and like energetic and dunks is very good at being like bringing like process to the business like i think dunks is a much better manager than i am like he's very very good at like managing people and building plans and i can learn a lot from that but i think it's good to have like both of us in there like the like probably more like the energy bit that i might bring and then dunks like so unbelievably like credible to the business and i think that really helps with like the team as well so a lot of what you mentioned there is the if you if you back your liquid you back your products yeah you back your team fantastic you need to make sure that people are receiving it and buying it and if you've got a team that you want to grow with that needs funding to do so. Yeah. So just for context, for those listening yeah. or watching, hello. Talk us through the fundraising rounds to date. Yeah. And then I think it'd be worth really pulling on the challenges and difficulties within each phase of that. Yeah. Just so people have more of an understanding of, of, of what these actual things mean. Because you can hear, right, Business X has raised one and a half million pounds. You think, wow, it's, it's how that's used, what that does, where that goes, how that's invested, and what stress and challenge comes <laughs> with that, which is the stuff that doesn't get spoken about yeah. quite as much. Yeah. So fundraising, talk us through it in practical terms, yeah. and then we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the challenges along the way. Oh, God, yeah. I'm sure I'll have some investors who are going to enjoy <laughs> listening to this. Uh, we've raised close to four million pounds to date over the last... Um, over the last four years and we've done that in kind of four funding rounds we've basically raised around like every year basically from the start the key thing we've always done when raising money and for context our investors are all um like we've got some like great family office investors in there um a uk-based family a uk couple of uk-based family offices and an american family office in there who are like unbelievably like supportive really like back where this category is going and are like great great to be building with we then also have kind of like some high net worths on the cap table. So some angels, some people who've made some money in, in past careers who, again, like I think they're really excited about the alcohol free opportunity because they feel it themselves. Like that's the best thing when you go and like you're trying to raise money from someone and you find someone who is 
a great beer drinker, but is really looking to live that healthier lifestyle and gets the product, like that helps a lot. And then we also have what we call like strategic value ads. So people who maybe aren't putting in huge uh, cash tickets, but are running their own business, have run their own business and are like unbelievable when it comes to like, can I get like a piece of advice here? Like, can you give me a few minutes? Like prime example, a business called Mindful Chef, which is like a meal yep. delivery business. The founder Giles is like an investor in our business and he's like an unbelievably busy guy running this like huge business. I can go to him with any question. I'll have a voice note in half an hour, like giving me, giving me his read. And that stuff is like invaluable. Yep. You get investors like that. So that's, um, that's a bit about like our, our cap table and who we've got involved. What we've always tried to do in like our, whenever we're like raising money is have like really clear milestones of things we want to deliver with the money we're raising. So at the start, we went and raised like a little bit of money and it was literally like, we want in the next six months to get our beers into people's hands to prove that a people like the liquids so make sure we get like good reviews and we would have like a kpi that we want to deliver there so x amount of reviews are five stars b that our brand is really resonating so building followers on social media having people like taking photos of themselves drinking our beer like proving they liked like liked, liked our brand and the third thing we wanted to prove is like who is drinking this product because we had an assumption about who would be drinking it someone a lot like yourself to be honest, was probably like written in one of like our, our early decks. And we went to our investors and said, we're gonna prove these three things. This is what we're gonna try and learn over the next six to nine months, which meant that when I went back to those investors six to nine months later, I could say, this is what we said we were gonna do. This is what we've done. Now I need a little bit more because now I want to prove that we can make it work in bars and restaurants. So we'd have like three more milestones that we'd aim to deliver the next year so that I could then go back to the investors and say, remember those three milestones I said I'd deliver? We've done two of them. One of them didn't happen because that's life. And this is really, really tough, but we've done two of them. Now I want to raise a bit more money to, to grow and do the next part of the business. So I think it's being like really, really clear with what you want to do with the, the cash, with the capital, because actually like being given loads of money in a business can actually be a really, really bad thing because yeah. you can like go in a million different directions. And there's tons of like, tons of opportunities there to like go and do different things. Whereas the biggest challenge for us is being like super, super focused. So when we first raised money, the business looked very different to how it looks now because we were like a D to C business. And this was like the height of like the D to C boom around COVID where like you were getting like crazy oh, yeah, valuations yeah, yeah, yeah. and cost like infl interest rates for time, nothing. So it was really easy to raise capital. So we went through that stage and we built, we were building a D to C business. And then we made the conscious decision to move away from being so D to C focused and continue to grow in traditional sales channels like bars, restaurants, grocery stores. So every time we've raised money, we have to just make sure we position the business the right way. I mean, everything you said there is within the context of non-alcoholic beer, but pretty much all of it could be applied to not even a business setting, but more a general development goal setting point of view, because I, I think the overarching thing I took from that is, is, is when you have a runway of opportunity, is just being lasered in on what you want to achieve within that time, yeah. which is why if we, I mean, to put it in a training perspective, from my point of view, the more scatty training goals are the less my training is effective yeah. the more honed in and direct within the timeline my training goals are the more effective the week to week the month Definitely. to month the consistency is over time and i think it's, it's always working backwards from clear direct tangible measurable goals in any setting that means that you can actually make forward motion towards that and have confidence you're doing the that's, right thing, which, key, which like, is key. Cause if you don't have confidence, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's it like forward motion, right? Like you have to have like a clear way because you can do lots of things like this and like go from side to side, but you need to be like really clear to make those small steps. So the first six to nine months, I can imagine were terrifying because essentially <laughs> you, you had a decent lump of cash that you then had to convert into basically verifiable sales sales. Yeah. But what would happen if that wasn't wasn't done? I yeah. mean, how are you dealing with the pressure yeah. as an individual of the, right, we are working to this end and we know yeah. this end, this wall, we have no money left. Yeah. So we need to get to that wall and then we need to ascend and get down from the obstacle of we need loads more money to then yeah. create another wall for ourselves to reach. Because yeah. it's it's not, you can't plan infinitely into the future. You can't ever get complacent and comfortable with the set, with the, with the sort of process that you're describing. So how did you, going from a corporate job, manage that pressure and actually keep your head switched on to be able to deal with that? Because that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, and I would like, I'd be lying if I'd said like, I've like totally like mastered this and... I've got it like all together. And I want to make that really, really clear. Like we definitely 
we definitely don't when it comes to like managing stress and it is like it is really really it is terrifying and i think when we both left our jobs and you start like launching a brand on instagram and you start doing this stuff and there's that period where all your mates like this is really cool what what you're doing and they might see loads of stuff going on and we were kind of chatting about this earlier on they might see it like popping up and stuff like running a startup is like it's like that like swan analogy that duck analogy right like up top everything looks fine and under control but underneath it's like fucking yeah. furious and that is exactly how i feel like a lot of the time because there's you might see things that look like they're going great but there's a lot of problems going on going behind the scenes that's the nature of a startup i think like it's a different kind of pressure you feel when you're taking, when you're working like a corporate job. So when you're working at AB InBev and you're getting like a salary and you've got like targets that you want to hit, there's like, there's pressure for sure. When you get money from someone that that person has like worked really, really hard to like earn and they are choosing to give you that cash to hopefully make a return instead of doing something else with it. That's an entirely different kind of pressure. And because that's like personal responsibility. And I would say like we both really feel that with our shareholders, not just that like we need to make sure that we like deploy the capital in like a really, really like as sensible a manner as possible. But like they're out, they've also like charged us with getting them like a really good investment. Like no one's really invested me to return like a small amount. Like they've backed us to like really go for it sensibly, but to like pr to provide something. So you definitely like feel that, that challenge. And um, I don't know if that answers answers your question well, i guess the answer is you, you you don't necessarily cope with the pressure but you obviously do because we've got there but it's the pressure is still prevalent yeah the, and it, it's not going to get it's probably not going to go away it, no i think <laughs> that's that, the thing isn't it that's a really important point i remember my old my old boss at ab InBev, who was really really supportive when i told him i was leaving to to set to set this up i was like i've always wanted to run like my own business i think when i was younger i was probably someone who would say like i want to be an entrepreneur i always want to run my own business I think before you do it, you assume that means like you run your own diary and you're your own boss and you're all this kind of stuff. And like, yeah, there's an element of that. But actually, I report to like a bunch of like investors and shareholders now. So and you're a slave to the business you created. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> ex ex yeah. Ex exactly. There's this like, yeah, this, this thing that that you love that gives you like so much energy. And like, to be clear, like is, is my life's work is also this thing that gives you so much anxiety and like keeps keeps you up at night. But that's part of it and it's like anything like it's like if you're training for something if you're like so you've had some like pretty impressive rugby players on this pod over the last few weeks like you have to sacrifice there is pressure and like pressure can actually be a good thing because i think for dunks and i would both say like it has allowed it has encouraged us or motivated us to do, to do stuff that six years ago we probably wouldn't have thought would be possible so on the theme of pressure a lot of non-alcoholic beer businesses have gone under yeah. recently and I have theories, personally. I mean, there might be clear reasons that are available on the, on the internet, but I haven't actually discovered that. But my, my logic as to why a few specific have gone under yeah. with, with sort of an understanding of the market, yeah, yeah. the family's always been in, in, yeah. in the alcohol trade, is one thing. But more importantly, watching competitors essentially fall. Yeah. Is your immediate reaction a sense of opportunity or a sense of dread? I think my immediate reaction is like neither of those things, if I'm honest. Like you meet your immediate reaction is like sad. You are like you you're sad and you definitely feel for the people running those businesses. Um nobody knows more about running a non alcoholic beer business than someone running a non alcoholic beer business. Yeah. So it's funny, like when you get in a room at these trade shows and I thought beforehand when, you, when you'd see like competitors, it would be like you're playing sport and you're like, I hate those guys. But you're not because yeah. you're actually like out of everyone in the world, like he or she knows exactly what I'm going through right now. So when you see one of them like go under, like it is really, really sad. And I, I do mean that, like I'm big on this category, like this category, my business can't work if the category doesn't work. Yeah. So I want like good players in, the, in this category. I, I welcome them. So selfishly, I, I'm sad, but I also like really feel for people who, have gone out like I know how hard it is and I think some people might see a headline it's like oh business goes under and you're like oh that person will be fine and they'll find a new job like it, that will really really that will be really sore and yeah. if it was to happen to us it would be really sore so my first thing is sad when you say like is it dread or op opportunity like I don't think when when the businesses go under it doesn't prove that it's any harder because we knew this would be hard and a journalist actually called dunks when one of our competitors went under and said said it was kind of similar question like oh they've said it's really hard that's why they've gone under and dunks reaction was like i didn't start this because i knew it'd be easy yeah 
like we knew this was going to be hard. Like if you think about what we're doing, we're taking on the biggest branding machines in the world, right? Like yeah. Budweiser. It, it, there's not there's not there's not many industries where things are as consolidated as in exactly. as in beer. Exactly. I mean, for, the, for those for those listening that might not be Heineken have when I left Heineken they had 252 brands on their books and they've since yeah. absorbed many more I mean they've offset some but yeah. yeah it fosters I think a pint of fosters is sold on average every seven seconds yeah. pre pre March 2020 that was the case anyway that's obviously dropped a little bit now with habits but mind you I'm sure maybe fosters drinkers still drink as frequently <laughs> as they used to yeah. but my, my take on yeah, what do you think? My, my take on it was potentially that brands that have struggled have fallen out of the the simplicity that you referred to the three the three milestones within each fundraising round was a really good way of showing that simplicity and clarity is what is going to help you survive in this category. And I think the ones that struggle most are the ones that have broadened their range too much. Whereas you have two simple products, mm-hmm. which is two things to push, which is brand visibility, brand equity and continued customer service and growth which means that if you're only doing that across two products that's easy than doing it across six across eight yeah across spreading yourself spreading yourself too thin because you've only got so many SKUs that you can sell at one point to this point and then oh, yeah. we don't want that one we want this one sorry that's out of stock because that's the most popular but we can give you these ones and then all of, all of your capitals yeah. tied up in things that haven't sold as well etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think simplicity is what will help survive in this category but I think the category as a whole is misunderstood because, like I was saying before, the the, the sort of strange insult that people take to alcohol-free alcohol. Yeah. I mean, it's not just beer. I mean, yeah. it, it, there's alcohol-free spirits companies. Yeah. People think, oh, well, there's no duty, therefore it should be cheaper. Yeah. Well, yes, but also, going back to what we said, big beer brands own pretty much every beer brand on the planet, yeah. which means that their costs are, are significantly lower yeah. because they get massive wholesale preference. So for a small challenger brand to take that on, they don't get the same costs. Yeah. I mean, this this doesn't just apply to booze. This applies to every yeah. artisanal trade. But there's a strange, especially in Britain, there's a strange identity attachment to beer, which means that this this to some is an insult. But for me, yeah. I'm not sober either. You're not sober. Yeah. I, the bad thing is, I kind of feel I'm constantly falling into the trap of saying that I only binge drink, which hmm. isn't probably, yeah. isn't probably a good it's message. On or not isn't a good message yeah. to send, but. The ceremony of weddings, stag dudes, yeah. friends coming together for the first time in ages are where I will justify a hangover and, yeah. a, and acknowledge that all of the things that I don't like about alcohol are going to be a reality rather than trying to trick myself into thinking, oh, if you have a six pint, you'll be fine tomorrow. You won't be fine tomorrow. Yeah, That's six. <laughs> Tried, tried three, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, yeah, three pints is enough to put me yeah. to bed these days. But it's a case of, it, it, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of an example of, of where there's something similar it's i mean may, maybe it's it's not quite the same because of nicotine but vaping mm-hmm. vaping has become much more popular yep because it doesn't have the negative effects of cigarettes i know there's still nicotine which has different effects mm. and there isn't even enough research because vaping's too young to be able to comment on it but i think the argument with vaping whether intentional or not when it began was that it was inherently healthier right yeah than cigarettes were due to the carcinogens and everything involved i don't know nearly enough about the example to really really develop that but it's replacing one bad thing with a slightly less bad thing which is a health-driven decision whereas this is replacing one arguably depending on the relationship with it quote unquote bad thing because it's it's not inherently a bad thing i know americans would disagree but it's not inherently a bad thing and kind of replacing the ceremony ritual box ticking association in a healthier way and if for the individual that allows them to have the same enjoyment then in my mind that's that's a good thing but the the challenge for you is that i'm not going to sit here and have seven of these yeah because you're not you say that because you're not getting the addictiveness of the alcohol i just yeah. and it's also not as diuretic which means i don't yeah think, right i'm, I'm that's not that's an interesting one so like you, you like, were, should we serve it with peanuts and stuff like that like, uh, i'm allergic to salty. peanuts yeah. so that's not gonna work that's that, not gonna right? work but yeah you like you wouldn't i've always found pints hilarious mm. because you wouldn't sit and have six pints of squash yeah even if you really Why enjoyed squash i mean i like squash and i've never sat and had yeah. six pints of squash Why it's because it it's diuretic but it's yeah it's it's all these things so yeah i, I think that the, the case for it's very clear why the product exists if you're sober mm-hmm. i think a lot of people can't read between the lines as to what the case is for when you're not yeah and what the middle ground looks like yeah so what are the trends 
that you've noticed from all of the the market research, the customer acquisition, and the data that you've got of the people that are choosing to purchase from you? Yeah. And what 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 are the what are the essence of the arguments that you would expect them to make as to why they make that purchase? Yeah, I would say like the first thing, and this was actually somewhat surprising, is we did um, the nature of having a DTC business is we can constantly chat to our consumers and like ask them like who they are, when they're drinking their dates, why they're drinking their dates. We learned before Christmas, 90% of our consumers still drink alcohol. Yeah. Which that was probably m- m- bigger proportion than I was expecting. So That's 90- way, way bigger than I was expecting. 90% of our consumers are still drinking alcohol. So that tells me that 10% are totally sober and don't drink don't drink any alcohol, but 90% still have like a relationship with alcohol, which I think is really, really important to, 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 to acknowledge. One of the things you mentioned there that I thought was interesting is you're like, you won't sit and like have like seven of these in like a sitting the way you may sit and have like seven beers in like a pub on a Saturday night. I could maybe agree with that, that you might not have like seven alcohol free beers in a, in a pub on like a Friday, Saturday night, because maybe you're not getting the energy out of it, but you can drink these on a lot more occasions through the week when you can drink alcohol. Yeah. And that's something that's been really interesting chatting to our consumers is it's okay. Yes. There's an element of it might replace an alcoholic drink in a Friday night, Saturday night. And what we do see in our like on trade customers who are bars and restaurants, is what we call zebra drinking. So I'll go out for five beers and three of them will be alcoholic and two will be non-alcoholic. So they do mix and match. So there's that on the Friday, Saturday night. What a lot of people are telling us is that it allows them to have a beer in a situation where beer is no, where alcoholic beer is no longer relevant. So the football's on on the Monday night. I've got home, I'm cooking my dinner. I can have two days and I wouldn't have had any beers there before. Tuesday lunchtime, Wagamamas. We're in every Wagamamas in the UK. We sell as much days from 12 till four in Wagamamas as we do four till eight. So people are having a beer at lunchtime and then going oh, back to the okay. office and they wouldn't be doing that before. So for us, it's like, it's actually not about like less beer. It's like more beer. In so more it's, it's, free, it's frequency over volume. Yeah. Like we're going to do a run club tonight, right? Yep. Like people are going to like finish running, like have some pizza. Like they wouldn't have an alcoholic beer there. That wouldn't make sense for that consumer anymore who yep. is like so health conscious. I bet you they're going to have like one or two days. So it's actually bringing like this amazing beer thing and putting it in like more occasions. What What is the data on the actual category? Because I'm sure you'll be much more up to speed yeah. than I will be. So growth wise since pandemic. Yeah. How in terms of percentage numbers in the UK, because obviously you're only DC in the UK for the time being. Um, what is that? What does that look like? Just so people have a context of, because it's, fa- it's the fastest growing category, yeah. but there aren't other categories that are really growing. Yeah, so is, that's, is, 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 yeah. is the important thing to caveat this with. Beer. But I'm sure that's not how you mentioned it in a, in a business plan. <laughs> yeah, I think the important thing to know is like beer is as a category is like stagnating and like slight decline in like two major countries we use an example, like UK and the US. Alcohol free beer in UK and the US is like 2% of the beer category. It's okay. growing at double digits, like year, year on year growth, double digit year on year growth, but it is like only 2%. Now, when you take a step back and think like how big the beer category is, like it's massive. Like I think there's something globally, it's tea, water, beer, coffee in terms of like volume of like liquid drinks. So beer is massive. Wow. Like we both work for big, you work for big beer companies. But if it's only 2% of the total beer category right now, you're like, okay, that needs to grow. But then when you take a step back and think about like health, younger consumers, I think I saw something the other day, 40% of 18 to 25 year olds drink no low products. Yeah. Like that never would have happened when I was 18 to 25. No. Like never would have happened. Like 40%. That's huge. So that's showing us like younger consumers driving the category. So when you pair that with also thinking about like all the occasions where alcohol free beer is relevant, your Monday night, your Tuesday night, all of a sudden we're like, can we take beer, can we take alcohol free beer from 2% of beer to 10% in the next five years? Like definitely. And that is a massive opportunity. And the, 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 the amount of is. the amount of people in that percentage is absolutely astronomical. Huge. Isn't it? Like, yeah. Just think about like in dollar term. I think like beer's worth like beer's worth hundreds of billions of dollars globally. So you said it yourself, like you worked at Heineken, Heineken have Heineken yep. Zero. They're doing it. So we're like really, really optimistic about the category. And I think what you've seen in like health, like everything you do, right? Like health is what is driving this. This isn't like a flash in the Or performance, because I mean yeah. it's important to acknowledge I've probably crossed the threshold of training for the sake of health and health alone yeah i'm probably actually erring on the side of this is this is potentially shaving years off your tendons <laughs> rather than adding to them but i've made my peace with that i would say like your followers as well probably think of themselves as like like health is health yeah, is, the, the, is the, leaning towards more performance now right yeah i'd say they're, they're largely intertwined but i think it's 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 uh, 
sounds very profound to say, but it's kind of being um, holding themselves accountable to who they actually believe themselves to be. Right, right. Which means that self development, forward motion, and drive and ambition are sort of at the core of all of this. Yeah. And anything that gets in the way of that starts making less and less sense. And that yeah. doesn't mean that that person demonizes alcohol or that person therefore thinks it's inherently bad. But it might mean that, like you mentioned, they don't drink on the Thursdays in London. Yeah. They don't drink on the Thursdays with work. They don't yeah. maybe absolutely hoon it every yeah. every Saturday because they think, you know what, I'm going to spend a couple of hours on Sunday doing X, Y, Z, which I am now more conscious and aware of is good for me. Yeah, that and just, makes them feel better. Yeah, right? yeah. But it's again, it's like I, I, I've i gone social. And again, there's the argument that if you're needing alcohol to enjoy spending time with the people you're spending time with, you're spending time with the wrong people. And I fully yeah. agree with that yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in most settings. But things like, if we're, if we're talking about ceremony and tradition, yeah. Sober stag do's, yeah, I can't yeah, really yeah. see. <laughs> Sober weddings, I can't really see. And that's yeah. more of a reflection on Britain as a whole. But yeah. it's, those are the, the occasions where, for me, it's if I've got an excitement and a sense of emotion around people coming together again, there is a part of me that is aware. Fortunately, I'm aware and have control over the situation, which is yeah. the main thing, that I can kind of turn it on and off, um, whereby I, I generally don't drink unless let's say again yeah i'm not promoting binge drinking but i am aware i'm kind of saying that's what i do right is i'm going to weddings after next week i will d demolish franchuk winery yeah. red wine at that in high volume yeah and it'll probably beat me up a little bit for a few days that follow. You, you it's giving you that like energy that losing your inhibitions yeah. and it's a like, ceremony it's, it's a trade-off yeah. you're willing to make yeah that's it yeah. That, that that is the thing is it yeah. where are you willing to make the trade-off and if you're if you're not if you're trying to pretend the trade-off isn't there then that will potentially create a negative feedback mm -hmm. loop with the thing itself and i think it's, it's it's quite popular to be very all for sobriety or for all in on this all in on that whereas actually life's a lot more gray than it is yeah. black and white and i appreciate that for some people dogma and black and white is something that might be necessary for behavioral patterns but for those that don't fall into that category i think it's for, i mean for me it's as somebody who previously thought the category was a load of bollocks when I was being told to flog Heineken zero zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. the conversations I had with people as to how they implemented it were mostly from people that actually weren't sober. Right. I, right. I've even seen a few things recently of people so that sober Instagram reels, yeah. sober pages. So yeah, they don't even have Instagram uh, alcohol free beers because for them that represents it could be triggering and, mimicking, yeah. mimicking something that they know they have a negative relationship with. Right. Therefore to further detach themselves from it. Yeah. It would be the same equivalent as a vegan not having vegan bacon because right. they don't the, want to the, have, the yeah. premise is kind of of the same ilk. So yeah. it's a fascinating category. But again, with all of the ceremony and pomp of alcohol in Britain, it yeah. does mean that there's a lot of people that find it insulting, which I find yeah. very funny. You should see if you looked at like our Facebook comments, like some of the hate, some of the like it's unlike repeatable some of the stuff that we get like <laughs> y'all show you offline like it's it's oh, i've seen some of it i've some seen of, some of it some of yeah. the stuff is like it's wild but then you're like okay like it's pretty clear like who we're brewing this business for and it's yeah. not like that so people which, which helps but yeah i think to your point around like sober stag dudes and stuff like that like i'm actually doing my first ever dry january okay so i've been running an alcohol free beer business for three years now this is the first time i'll do dry january and even i've been surprised that how good i felt from it and i went out for beers with the team twice last week once i drank three guinness zero zeros because they didn't have ours the others i had three pints of days and on a wednesday thursday night like i'm not looking to get pissed yeah i'm not looking to like lose my inhibitions i had three beers with my team got home eight hours sleep woke up went to the gym and it was on saturday morning last week i was like this is there is something here about like waking up feeling fresh i didn't feel like i'd missed out on anything so it's that like it's that like when you find yourself like sleepwalking to having a couple of beers and you like you meet a pal and you've had three alcoholic beers you feel like crap you eat something crap on the way home and you're like what was the point in that yeah. like i didn't need that so that's where we like we think there's an opportunity to really allow people to like still socialize see their pals have that ritual but just not make like not make the compromises that they have to sometimes with alcohol yeah it's a fascinating one and there's probably people listening that still might yeah it's it's highly individual which i think yeah is, which is the main point is that i have absolutely zero dogma about any of this it's just for me you know what where i might have had two beers cooking a stir fry yeah. on a wednesday i will now have two days yeah and therefore that's less alcohol consumed within the week and i don't feel like i'm restricting myself in any way so therefore equal yeah. 
good yeah. thing overall. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's the trade-off. The trade-off is the question I ask myself and I will premeditate when I make the trade-off. Yeah. And therefore not punish myself for feeling a certain way that was entirely predictable. Yeah. Because it's a choice. Yeah, exactly. It's a choice. It's, <laughs> it's like, a choice, yeah. It's like diet, right? Like yeah. I probably try and like eat slightly better than I used to, but I still love like having a five guys or something like that every now. I'll have it and I'll feel like crap after yeah. it, but I'm willing to make that trade-off for, for that moment. So after this we're going to get some pizzas and do, yeah. a, do a run club and you've already mentioned it loosely but why why is is community interaction for the health conscious consumer such an important thing from a brand point of view yeah i think for us it's like such it's like such a no-brainer that our position like plays a role there like people are, like yes it's a run club people are active but we're having pizzas it's a group it's social yeah, and that's what beer is. It's like this, like amazing, like social liquid. Like best thing, strongest thing about my business is you open it and cheers it. Like it's this social thing. So when you've got people together, it makes perfect sense to have like a not a non-alcoholic beer. I think for us, it's always been like a really good part of our like community building because we found that like runners are, are consumers of alco alcohol free, yep. particularly in this role. I think for us as a business, it gives us like a great opportunity to engage with consumers, to learn, to understand, like what's going on with them and then selfishly selfishly for me as a business owner like gives me tons of energy yeah like, i get to see like 50 people like i get to work out with 50 people tonight and they enjoy this thing that i've been building for the last four years that definitely gives me and the team like so much energy as simple as that simple as that well i think on that note we should probably tidy up ahead of those 50 people arriving yeah you, we've got a lot to do out there <laughs> <laughs> which is which is our fault i'll hold my hands up and say but that's uh that is the nature of, of current circumstances very much enjoyed that mike Thanks where is the best place for people to head other than obviously daysbrewing.com daysbrewing.com you get them on the website but you can also buy our beers in tesco waitrose sainsbury's wagamama's thousands of pubs and bars across the uk so yeah if you see it try it if you want to reach out to me at any point you can get me on linkedin or instagram fantastic thank you very much awesome thanks for your time bud